on this. And uh, the first thing I want to say is that Henry's question was very deep, and also it is debated. So it's deep and it's debated. So what I'm sh I'm really sharing my opinion. If we were doing a, a doctrine of God class, if we were doing a doctrine of salvation class, we would we would be discussing these. So, uh, but we're not. So I, I didn't want to stress someone out who is not so familiar. So that was kind of the reason for me not really answering Henry's question. Um, and the other thing too is we just didn't have the time. So tonight what I want to do is I want to just talk through this. So so correct me if I'm wrong, Henry, your question was, did God take a risk in, in calling Abraham? Mm -hmm. yeah. that's, that's your question, right? So, so that's the question before. So, so, so the question is dealing with, could Abraham have chosen to disobey God and not to do what God was calling him? So that, that's the question, okay? So, <clears throat> so, so in looking at, at, even in the life of, of in, in the direct life of Abraham, uh, we, we can't answer that question. Does everyone understand that? Um, in, in, in his own life, we can't directly answer the question because there's nothing revealed about God's working inside of Abraham. Does everyone, does everyone agree with me? With that mm -hmm. there's nowhere where it says God says I did this and Abraham had to do it right it, it doesn't it just is giving us the story right so we have to really look outside of the the Abraham story to see the question I want to ask is um, how So the question is, how does God work specifically in relationship to those who he calls? So, so how does God guarantee that his promise is going to come about, right? That's the question. Everyone's tracking with me there. That's the question. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to slowly just add passages of scripture to the right. Um, I'll add and then you'll see them pop up. And we'll just discuss each one. And then we'll say... Uh, can we apply what we were looking at where, where it's clear? Can we apply that to Abraham's life? Maybe we can, maybe we can't. Then, that's, really, that's really something that uh, you would have to determine yourself. Um, so here, let's look at the first one. If you have your Bibles, I'll put it on the screen. Turn in your Bibles to uh, Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 to 5. Jeremiah chapter one verses four to five. So I have that up on the screen here. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look over. Number one, this is the, this is the calling of a prophet. Okay. So this is not the calling of Abraham, but this is a calling of a prophet. Okay. So let's look at the text here and let's see what the word of God says. Jeremiah 1, 4 to 5. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. <laughs> so... The, the, the first thing, I, we, just highlighting some things here. This, this describes a time. So I'm always going to be using our categories now. So this is before Jeremiah was even in the womb. The, the Lord says, I knew you. Now, so this is the object, this is the knowing, and 
the Lord is the actor. Okay. Now, this is not, it doesn't say, it doesn't say this. It doesn't say I know about you. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say I, I knew of you. It says I knew you. So this is, this is where this idea of, of divine foreknowledge comes from. And this is intimate. And personal. Is everyone tracking with me the significance here? This isn't simply, this isn't simply a statement of, 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 um, you know, of a general knowledge of information. This is just thinking linguistically, thinking in language. If I say I know Danny, if I say I know Henry, I, I, I'm not saying I know about Henry. I'm not saying I know facts about Henry, right? I'm saying I know Henry in a personal way. You, you, can't, you can't twist that. I wouldn't say I know, let's just say, uh, Romaldis. No one would say I know Roma, uh, Mayor, Mayor Romaldis. There was a personal, there was a personal, uh, personal relationship, okay? So what we see here is that in, in um, uh, so let's move on here. So uh, moving on, before you were born, again, a time reference. Let me just highlight the, these categories before. Again, action, I, I consecrated, or this is really set apart, set apart. Same idea, action. And then this is appointed you a prophet to the nations. One second here, let's see who's coming in. Okay, anyway. So everyone's tracking with me here. So so here, now, now this kind of opens up, this opens up our understanding of what's going on behind the scenes, at least concerning prophets. Can we all agree with that? This, this would be an example. This would be a, uh... now this is not in every single case. This is not in every single case perhaps, but we can say this is typical, okay, for the prophetic, prophetic commissioning. Now looking at Abraham's life, Abraham functioned as a prophet, he functioned as a priest, and, and in many ways, he also, he functioned in kingly duties, right? So not that he's a king, but he had, he had ruling uh, kingly duties, okay? Um, so we can at least say, wow, perhaps this is in the same way that, that Abraham was called, perhaps. Is everyone tracking with me there? Almost ready here. I, I think you can see me loading it up. So just one moment. Okay, so let's read this. So this now, this is now number two. This is uh, Apostle Paul, Paul's commissioning. So look at what the Apostle Paul describes in his life. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached to me is not man's gospel. 
I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God and violently tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. Look at this. But when he, he, description, who had set me apart before I was born and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult anyone. So let's look at this closely here. Look at, look at how he is described. Look at how Paul is described. So it's God the Father. This is the action set him apart. So it's it's the consecration, so it's just like it's just like the example with 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 uh, Jeremiah. He set him apart. Look at the time. Look at the time. It's almost identical. Before I was born, and look, there's a second. So this is description number one. So God is the one who sets apart before he was born, number two. Uh, and description number two. Called me by his grace. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and call me by his grace, look at this, was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach it among the, the, the nations. So this is purpose, the purpose for the revealing is so that he might Paul might do this action of preaching. This is preaching Christ. To the nations. But again, look here, look. He who set me apart called me. Let me highlight these. Could Paul have not done it? <laughs> you could say, well, we still don't know. We know that he sets apart before he was born, so it's really not, it's, God is not looking at Paul's works. He's being set apart before he's born. If ever there was one, Paul's works are terrible. He should have never been selected, right? He's killing the church, right? So but he's been set apart before he was born. He was called He was called by grace, right? When God was pleased, when it pleased him to reveal himself to me, what's the purpose? Is is Paul going to fail? <laughs> Again, we can say go ahead. I think no, Pastor. <laughs> because it's, uh, for me, uh, as I, I am interpreting this, it's quite clear that God selected him already. He's already chosen. So it's not, uh, uh, I think maybe that's why, uh, that's why Paul was not, his 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 background when we saw his previous I mean his life before he became an apostle yeah. it's like it's quite impossible why and then suddenly he was changed so I think it's it's a more it's more evident that he really is chosen yeah before 
before. I mean, he said it exactly before he was born. Yeah. So he is. So 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 here's the thing, Kaya. He's chosen. He's called. The question is, can he fail? That's the question. So again, it's coming back to, can he fail? Uh, yeah. At least we can say that it's highly unlikely. And looking here, it's almost as if these two. These two are almost analogous, right? It's, it's, it's a very similar calling, okay? All right. So we're, we're going we're gonna to continue to go. So let me just, let me just uh, underline this really quick here. So at least here we have two examples now of, of, uh, of this calling to a mission. Remember, going back to Abraham, Abraham was called, right? He was called to a purpose. He was chosen and called to a purpose, all right? And so in these two other examples that are clear and unambiguous, we see that when God calls these other prophets and apostles, I would really say that Paul is, functionally, Paul is a New Testament prophet. Paul is the New Testament of the Old Testament prophets. It's the same, it's the same category. And actually, Paul sees himself in the same categories as a Jeremiah. Okay. Henry, you're thinking. What are you thinking? Are you agreeing, disagreeing? You're interested? Maybe this is. I see the I see the cogs on the wheel turning. Think. Let, let's let's get through. Let's get through these and then we can discuss. If you want to make a comment now, you can. We have a couple more passages. Let's go. Go ahead, Danny. Go ahead, Danny. The prophets were called the same way, in the same way as Jeremiah and Paul. What we be? Uh, what was the question? How many prophets were called the same manner? So, so, I, I, what I, um, what I want to say is that this this would be I would say is typical. Typical of the prophets. So Isaiah, Jeremiah, this is how they would be called. Now, people, maybe they would want to debate that. Maybe they'd say Paul is unique. Maybe they would say uh, Jeremiah is unique. Fair enough. Okay. Maybe after tonight, you would say, no, I agree with you, Tim. It's pretty, it's pretty clear. So um, <laughs> we'll see. But at least we have two examples where God is choosing before birth, even before the womb. For Jeremiah, it's before the womb. And there's that intimate personal knowledge, okay? All right, so let's go to the next passage. Let's go to the next passage. Let's go to Romans. So now we're going to move, transition from these prophetic callings to now our calling, okay? So we're now transitioning. <laughs> we're transitioning. So let's go now to Romans chapter 8, verse 28 to 30, okay? Romans chapter 28 to 30. Let me... Make a copy and paste here. Okay, so this is gonna get. I I I I don't. I'm not trying. I'm not trying to convince you. I'm trying to answer the question that was given, and and if if you're convinced, it's because it's the word of God. Okay, so this is where I'm at. But again, I'm not trying to convince you. Uh, I want you to be convinced by the word of God. And um, let's go ahead and read. So Romans 8, 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. So just, I want to, I'm just going to stop here for a minute so that w this would be a knowledge content. We know that those who love God, all things work together for good. Now it would seem to be that concerning Concerning this category, let me just highlight here. So you have a, this is a reference concerning these, concerning these people. And then there's a description. Those who love God. Okay, so this is a description. All right. So looking at this passage, we would be tempted to say, oh, because a person has a good work of loving God, therefore, this statement is true. All things work together for good. So this is the, uh, 
the action. And we could say that this is the, this is the subject. Um, it's not really the actor because we're gonna see someone else as the actor. And then, and then this would be maybe, this would be purpose. And in, in our handout, I had reference. I'm thinking more and more that this is a, a purpose here. So, 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 so looking at this statement here, okay, we know that. What is the that? So, so, so the main idea is this, this knowledge statement, and then there's this, this is a content. The content is from here to here, okay? For we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. So, so everyone's clearly seeing here, it seems as if it's, it's, it's a tit for tat. Those who love God, things work together. So you have to love God, right? As if the loving is earning the good. Does everyone see this? What, how someone could interpret it, okay? But um, look, at, look at the clarification. Who are the those? Let's, let's, Paul wants to get specific. There's going to be a clarification here. For those, description. <laughs> it's, it's almost like this is also a clarification, right? This is, this is literally a further description. Well, look at the difference. Whereas here we have love, here we have love, here we have our called <laughs> in accordance with his purpose. So the, those, those who are loving God are the ones who are called. Those who love God is that's a present tense. So this is a present tense. This is present. This is past. <laughs> so the calling precedes the loving. The calling precedes the loving. Okay. Is everyone tracking with me? Now, there's two issues here. Number one, it's what the text actually says. And then the second issue is wrestling with what it means. So does everyone understand what I'm saying? Maybe you're wrestling with what it means, okay? But here, it, again, it's this idea that uh, we know that those who are loving God, all things work together. Who specifically? Let's rename these people. For those who are called according to his purpose. Now, it's not here. This is not called according to good works. Foreknowledge in the sense of in the sense in the sense of seeing faith, seeing future faith. It's very specific. It's his purpose. It's his purpose. Those who are called according to his purpose. God's calling is not because of what we do. It's now. Again, maybe you would not yet want to make this connection, but Abraham was not called because God was like, oh man, he's a good guy. I want him. Let's go on. For those whom he foreknew, there's that word again. We should not see it in simply about, but, but in personal knowledge. Personal knowing, just like Jeremiah. Those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. So actor, God is the one that foreknows. God is the one who predestines, <laughs> predetermines for us to be conformed to the image of the Son in order that he might be the first more among many brothers. Those whom he predestined,
There's the calling. He called. We already know that the calling is based upon his purpose. We know that because of here. Those whom he called, he also justified. Those whom he justified, he glorified. Who is the actor? It's God. God. So, so here's the thing. Now, I, I, it, looking at this, if we make it a conclusion, it, and it, it deals with a whole other host of questions, okay? And perhaps you're not ready to deal with those questions tonight. Fair enough. But what I want us to, to see here is that if God is, in fact, sovereign over our salvation, both in our, in our calling, in our belief, in our faith, in our uh, foreknowing, predestined, calling, justifying, glorifying, if he is the one doing, if it's, if it's his work, our salvation is guaranteed. If it's on us, we could lose it. And I think that's where it really, that's where it really, really comes down when it comes to Abraham. If it's on, oh, I wanna pick that man, just like, just like Henry picks a good worker that turns out to steal, just like maybe I, I choose a good student who turns, turns out to drop, drop out, uh, just like a pastor who is caught in adultery, then if, if, it, if it ends up being based upon us, then God's promises are really conditional upon man. He's only sovereign in as far as man doesn't drop the ball, okay? So if, if Abraham's faithful, his promise comes through. If it's not, oh, Cy Young, I'll just pick someone else, right? And so, uh, again, we, we haven't really got to a very strong, closed, lock type because I'm using other, these are illustrations. It's not yet perfectly clear. Although here, this is salvation, and this is concerning our, our, our salvation. And I would say this is already strong enough to say, because of Romans 4, this is how he worked in Abraham's salvation, okay? Um, so, so I think it's very strong. I think it's very strong. So I am giving you, if you're going to put categories on this, I am giving you a Calvinistic perspective. But you can see here, it's just, if my exegesis is accurate, it's just the biblical, it's just a biblical interpretation. Now, now people will, there, there'll be some Calvinists that will say certain things that maybe take it too far. Um, I'm not defending all Calvinists. I'm just looking specifically at that question. And what I see here is that, is that we are called, so, so it's, this is, this is true. Abraham is called a friend of God. Abraham was faithful. He was obedient. All right? He was outwardly obedient. So we must act. But when we, when we peel behind the scenes, when we look behind the scenes, we see that it's a sovereign God who is equipping uh, Abraham, who is, who is working with Abraham to bring it into reality, his promise, Okay. So this is dealing with our salvation, but again, it's correlated with the work of, this will be true of Abraham, because we believe that Abraham is in Christ. He's part of the covenant, the new covenant. It's always, this is why it's, we're, we're, we're teaching there's only one gospel. So there's only one gospel. There's only one promise. Everyone, uh, Eve, Adam, Abel, Noah. Seth, uh, and then Abraham, they're all in Christ. They've all receiving the salvation that God has planned. So this passage here, Romans is also, 
uh, in fact, dealing with Abraham. Here as well, Ephesians is dealing with salvation and thus what's going on behind the scenes with Abraham. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ. So is Abraham blessed in Christ? Yes, he is. He, is, he has to be. If he's not, if he's not in Christ, he will not, we will not see him in the eternal kingdom. Okay, so we need to be thinking of this is why it's so important. It's, they're all connected. Who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Now watch this. Even as he, look, chose us, he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. Now people will say, oh, he only chose, he only chose us, uh, he only chose us to be holy. But not, but that's not what the text says. It literally says, he chose us. This is separate. This is a separate clause. Grammatically, it's separate. Structurally, it's separate. Now, th this is part of the choosing, but he's chosen us nonetheless. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly places, um, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, because he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, and then, for what? That we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us. Again, this very strong terminology, predestined us. And look here, it's not according to us, it's according to his will. So coming back, did he take a risk with Abraham? <laughs> no. No, he, we, 100%, 100%. Um, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. Again, it's coming back to him. It's coming back to him. It's not coming back to anything we've done, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose. So let me just, I'm just going to highlight the, the work of God. I mean, look at this. Chose us. Predestined us according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, according to the riches of his grace, the mystery of his will, according to the purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance Having been, here we go again, predestined according to the purpose of him who works. <laughs> Gr grammar here. Him, who, the who is God, the Father. Works. All things. He works all things. According to us, according to what we do, according to the counsel of his will. <laughs> In him you have also, when you heard the gospel of truth, of, uh, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him were sealed with the, whole, with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire of it, acquire possession of it to the, the praise of his glory. Again, look here. Not only did he secure us in time past, in the cross, the sacrifice, but when we exercise faith, we have that guarantee. When you put that down payment on that, on that property, it's, it's yours, guaranteed. When you put that money down, you have that contract. Doesn't matter what happens. It's, it's done, right? And so how can God, so here's the thing. Uh,
how can God make promises if the promises are founded upon man's action? That's like fickle. It's like, <laughs> uh, throw the coin out, maybe. <laughs> unless, unless God is working in the heart of man and thus it's guaranteed. Now, this is where there's a divine mystery that, that does not excuse man. Man is always responsible. It does not excuse man. It doesn't, it, it, uh, uh, we accept both, okay? So God is sovereign. God is sovereign. He's in complete control. He's working all things according to the purpose of his will. And at the same time, we can never say, oh, well, God's in control, so I don't have to act, okay? But when we, when we peel behind the curtain, when we look behind the curtain to see what's going on in the background, God is in complete control. And so we have assurance even in our own lives. Think about this, Kapitan. Think about this. If our salvation is by faith through, uh, by grace through faith alone, right? Uh, First Peter says that our salvation is guarded by faith in the heavenly places. Okay, uh, the righteous shall live by faith. It's it's the gospel by which we stand, by which we cling to. First Corinthians fifteen. If if the source of our faith is us. And we have to cling to the gospel by faith. There is a chance that you would fall, okay? But if it if it comes back to the to the one who is working all things according to the counsel of his will, and you have genuine saving faith, you have a one thousand trillion bazillion guarantee that that you will receive the promise, okay? And so. You know, it's, I'll make a strong statement. God called Abraham. He called him. He said, if you do this, I'll bless you. But behind the scenes, God was equipping, giving Abraham the faith by which to do this. Now, I'm going to go to several passages and we'll be done here. This is going to be a review for some of you. But I'm kind of making connections here. So you might like, for those of you who had some of my classes already, you'll like this. Let's go, this makes a whole lot more sense. Let's go to uh, Romans, Romans 12, verse 3. So Henry, this was, out, this was before, this was a discussion before that we had, right? Uh, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment. So this is the works. This is God now going to describe the, the, the grace given. So again, this is uh, the actor is God, not Paul. And he says, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. So we talked about this. This is literally God distributing faith in accordance with these gifts. Okay, this is going to be describing the gifts. We remember having 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 different gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, okay? So what I'm making the correlation here is that in the same way that Abraham was given the faith to leave and to go, God gives us the faith to do the calling that he has called us to, okay? And so here we say that, that this is why God can call us, and, and, and it might be some great task or it might be some basic task. You're like, how can I do it? Because God is working to equip us, okay? Let's go to one other passage here. Hebrews 12, 1 to 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight that and sin which clings so closely and let us run the race with endurance, the race that is set before us, Looking to Jesus, the author <laughs> and perfecter of our faith. <laughs> so all, all of these, I hope all of these things are coming into, into connection here. That, yeah, this is what the word of God really seems to be saying. If, 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 if God is the one who foreknows who predestines, 
who calls, who justifies, who glorifies, it would make sense that he's the founder and perfecter. Okay? Let, let me just give two more passages just because I kind of saved these for last. And so then the question is, how can God, it's not fair if God's working inside our heart and controlling our heart. And again, my question would be, it's not what we would wish it to be. It's what the word of God says. And then we have to wrestle with that. Okay. So let's go to, uh, let's go to, I believe it's Proverbs 21, one Proverbs 21, one yes. <laughs> Proverbs 21, one, the King's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. And he turns it wherever he will. <laughs> you cannot, there's no way. You cannot get around this. What this is saying here is that, is that every part of humanity, God is sovereign, not man. So there's no part of us that is off limits. <laughs> the king's heart is in God's head and he turns it like a stream of water, wherever he will. Whose will is sovereign? Is man? Does, does God say, you know what? I want to maintain the purity of man. Man's will is off limits. I'll just try to guide. I'll try to encourage him. But at the end of the day, man has to choose. This seems to directly be opposing that. This seems to be directly opposing that idea. The king's heart is in the street, is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wants. Let's go to another passage. Again, just emphasizing that uh, who is really, uh, what part of man's being that is, is not under God's control. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24. The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness, God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. Look, look at the word. Grant. It, it's give. Literally, didomi. Didomi. Greek, give. You can see it at the bottom. It's not, this is the word give. God might give them repentance. <laughs> God is the source of even giving repentance. We saw he's the source, the author and perfecter of faith. He is the giver of repentance. And this is why we must be patient with the opponents. Because look at this. They are, this is hard, they are trapped by the snare of the devil. <laughs> so it's like... You know, the devil is also impacting our heart. They're trapped by the snare of the devil, captured to do his will. So again, what I'm trying to push against is this idea that every, God's, everything's under God's sovereign control except our will. Our will is ultimately free and God can't touch it. And these passages directly contradict that the, that theological proposition, okay? That doesn't mean that we're, we're not required to do what's right. That doesn't mean that, that God is the author of evil. What it does mean is that uh, God is sovereign. Nothing is outside of God's control. And if he chose to give repentance, he could. Again, that's what the text says. Maybe you, you want to investigate that and you want to do the exegesis. We can have a discussion. Let's go to one more example, and we'll close here. We, we can have a discussion and we can go. Let's go back now to the story of Abraham, but we're not going to look at Abraham. We're going to look at, a, at a, a contemporary of Abraham. So Genesis chapter 20, this is dealing with uh, uh, when, he, when he hides his, the nature of his marriage with Sarah to Abimelech. And so it says here that Abimelech, the king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said, Behold, you are a dead man. 
because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. Now Abimelech had not approached her. He said, to her, he said Lord, will you kill an innocent people? Did he not say himself, she is my sister? And she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and the innocent of my hands, I have done this. Then God said to him in the dream, yes, I know that you have done it in the integrity of your heart. And it was... <laughs> It was I who kept you from sinning against me. So God worked in Abimelech's heart and prevented him from committing adultery. So again, this does not remove the response. There's so many more passages we can go to. This would be a class in, in uh, the doctrine of God. Really, this is a class in the doctrine of God and also the doctrine of salvation. But I just... I really want to spend some time to answer the question. Now, this is, I'm answering the question that I'm coming back to the question that I'm coming back to this question here. Did God take, did, did, uh, did God take a risk in calling Abraham? Which is a profound question. I am so glad that, 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 that Henry asked it. And, and this is not all we could say. And perhaps you're not yet convinced. And, and you know, this, is, this would be a more Calvinistic uh, answer to the question. But I, I, I want to say that I think that if, we, if, we, if we're careful in our exegesis, we would say that this is biblical. And there's a lot of Calvinistic truths that are actually just biblical truths. There are some Calvinistic truths that are unbiblical. Um, and because at the end of the day, it's, it's people who are... Uh, people who are claiming different things. So, you know, um, let's have a time of conversation. What's your reaction? What's your, what's your thought to this? Um, Pastor Tim. Yeah, go ahead. In observing these passages and texts um, and how it defines, it is defined, um, there is a passage in Isaiah um, 45, verse 7, Okay. That God creates evil. <laughs> I, I'm just concerned about it. It says, I, I'll just read it. Uh, Isaiah 45, verse 7, King James Version. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Okay, so now, with without... Without, um, yeah, so without going into, I'd have to study it. I have it on the screen. Can everyone see my screen right now? Everyone can see my screen? Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So King James, uh, ESV has calamity. And if you're looking at the Hebrew, it's I make peace. I make, now it's literally evil, but it could also be calamity because there's a range of meaning there. So, yeah, I, I, would, I would say that the range of meaning would not allow, you know, it could be evil or it could be destruction. So without investigating this passage, I would say that both are true, right? So, for example, we just did the Bible's big story, right? God brought severe calamity upon the earth. He killed all of, all of life. But that was his judgment, right? And that was just, okay? So seeing create calamity or this ra, 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 ra this, this uh, uh, Hebrew word ra, could be, uh, could be evil, but not in the sense of the evil that we're thinking about in the sense of like satanic evil, but in the sense of bringing destruction, bringing judgment. I think that's more of a sense, which is what's going on here. Yeah. Uh, let me just, answer uh um make 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 some comment on this on that, on that uh, assertion that god is the the creator of evil actually if you uh look at that uh, passage is a prophetic passage at the same time it's a, it's a it's a kind of uh metrical metrical writing so um in the context you, you could see that the context would would say that uh god is the one who formed the light and create the dark the, the darkness yeah. And the one who brings about peace and create calamity. So it's somewhat 
kind of parallelism. But uh, to be sure, this is not kind of evil that we are thinking of today. Uh, it's not a kind of moral evil that attributes to God because that's actually the, the, the myth of the question. Is God really the, the author of evil? Uh, the evil that, that really asserts is the moral evil. But that, that's not so because, uh, in fact, it, this, this passage really, uh, I would say, really proved that God is sovereign of, of what he is doing in this world. Because he said further that he is God. I am the Lord who accomplished all these things. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. No, I'm going to further on what I like, what Sonny's saying. is it, It's parallelism. We're actually going to do parallelism in two weeks. So in two weeks, we'll do parallel, uh, uh, Hebrew poetry. This is, this is a, a, a stanza, uh, parallelism. And so you, I, I really like what, what Sonny's saying, that the light and darkness, it's the two opposites, okay? And then the other parallel idea is that uh, peace and evil, and again, I, 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 I want to go back to what I said. It's not peace and evil as in like sin or law breaking. This is peace or destruction. Those are the two ends. If you look, at, if you look in society, peace and and calamity are the two are the two polar opposites in our society, right? To go into mass chaos is is calamity. We could say it's also evil. To be in a state of peace and blessedness is the complete opposite. And so you have the light and darkness. You have the peace and calamity, or the peace and evil. And I think that's that's really the sense. And it's, fur it's further strengthened with what Sonny's saying in this poetic stanza of the poetic genre. So I really agree. With, I like that observation, Sonny. Thank you for that clarification. Excellent. Let, let's just think about this. There's no pressure. What I hope that this will cause you to do is I hope that this will cause you to, to begin a journey of your own in studying this out for yourself. There's a range of, of viewpoints. This, this, is a, this is a deep, uh, in dealing with questions, right? So we, we had conversations about questions and answers with Kuya Bulboy in the past. And there's questions dealing with the text, and then there's philosophical questions. And so Henry's question was a philosophical, uh, a metaphysical question, dealing with, uh, did God take a risk? Okay, so that was beyond the text, because... The text just says, no, God was successful. Abraham was faithful and, and his promise continued, okay? But, but we're, we've moved from the text to much bigger questions, and now we're answering the question in the, in the scope of all, of all of Scripture. And so this is a question that I really want to say to you. I, I, I hope that this will bring out to you. Perhaps you were not, a, you were like, oh, you know, Calvinism, Arminianism, this stuff, it's just a waste of time. Let's just get biblical. I hope that you can see like, oh, wow, these, these discussions, th these are more central than I thought. Yeah, so what I, I want us to do is I want us to be thinking, like, you know, I don't want you to make a decision tonight or, or even next week. I want you to be thinking about these things, thinking, thinking deeply, because I, I tried to also bring in the practical that 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 there is great assurance this this type of question depending upon how you answer it really brings great assurance in our daily life in our life by faith and so you know some people say oh it's a deep question we just need to focus on the basics and and, and some people need to focus on the basics others those that are here tonight we're already advanced not, and we need to go on. We need to take that next step. And so I just want to really encourage you that um, to be thinking about these things. Maybe, maybe start a, a journal, writing down passages, and maybe, maybe investigate the other side. Start looking and comparing and contrasting, because this is really, this is the direction of theology, studying the deep truths of God. And um, this does affect our salvation from the standpoint of giving us assurance. So what I presented to you tonight, you know, maybe it, maybe it causes you to be very nervous because, wow, God is really in control, but it should give great assurance if we are in Christ. And you, and you might say, oh, well, how do I know I'm called? Believe! 
<laughs> right. So, so I don't, how do I know if I'm the call? Believe, go ahead. Uh,